Hey guys, we're here live at E3. We're in the PlayStation booth and we're gonna talk about the Evil Within. Joining me is Pete Hines from Bethesda Softworks. Thanks for joining us, Pete. Always good to see you, Sid. So, The Evil Within being developed by the fine folks at Tango Softworks. Tell me a little bit about what made you guys want to work with this team. Um, you know, we, we follow and keep in touch with um, developers that we like and respect. Um, Shinji Mikami and the work that he's done kind of speaks for itself. And so, in talking to him and what he was putting together at Tango, you know, we had a real interest in working with them and, and helping him realize his, his vision, which is, I want to take survival horror back to its roots and do, you know, a pure survival horror game. And he and his t team at Tango have been put together to do just that. And I'll say this, nobody makes a survival horror game quite like these guys. So the evil within, like you said, it's a very classic approach, you know, beautiful sets, gorgeous lighting. Let's actually talk a little bit about the tech first, because right. this is a game that's using id Tech 5, one of the creations of John Carmack, one of the legends of the industry, the godfather of 3D programming. <laughs> Let's talk about how this tech, though, infuses this game. I mean, it's coming to PS3 and PS4. Right. What is it going to bring to the party? Um, I mean, one of the things uh, that, that appealed to the guys at Tango about using id Tech is that it's super flexible and it's very clean. So they were able to take it and repurpose it for their own purposes. id Tech was built to make first-person shooters, right? For Rage and for other stuff that id was working on. And it was really up to Tango what they wanted to use, but after they took a look at id Tech, they said, we want to take this and modify it and make our third-person game with it. We think it's perfect what, what we're able to do to bring in things like dynamic lighting, um, to do all the stuff that they wanted to do with animation. Um, and it's and it seems to have suited their purposes really well. And we're taking a look at it right here. This is this is actual game footage, and you can see the game has a very dark look to it, deeply, deeply detailed. I'm sure it's going to look fantastic on PS4. I've seen it in action, and, and and there's some stealth elements to this game too. I mean, it's got the the sort of third person sort of count your bullets shooting mechanic, yep. but stealth is a heavy uh, uh, component here as well. Talk to us a little bit yeah, about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know when they first set out, what they what they said was. We don't want to just do another action-heavy horror game where you have lots of guns or lots of bullets and you're just mowing stuff down. That's not what survival horror means to us. So it is this blending of, you know, stealth and puzzle solving. There's a locked door. You got to get the key. Um, it's a little tough to tell from the from the demo and the gameplay footage, but a lot of this uh, stuff that you're seeing is dynamic. So how the creatures and the enemies will react in the environment is not the same every time. If you die and you go to replay a level, they're not gonna move the same way. So you have to think your way through and figure out right opportunities, maybe use distraction. Um, it, it is a game where you're gonna have limited resources. You got three bullets and eight guys that you need to you know, to figure out, like, do I try and kill these guys? Do I maybe use some traps to deal with them? Or do I just run away? Do I hide and let them go past me and then get to where I need to be? So it is a game where we want you to be constantly sort of off balance, terrified, but feel like you can use your wits to get through this scenario and survive and move to the next next level. Now tell me about the setup here, because you're, you're a detective and you're called to the scene of a heinous murder. Yep. And, and, and how do we get to where we are now? Uh, so what you're seeing here is all from that first part of the game, and basically Sebastian shows up to this asylum, dead bodies everywhere, something terrible and, and strange is going on. But the story from that point on is really a mystery. It's not something we're going to talk about. And part of the fun of the game is unraveling the puzzle. Like Sebastian is trying to figure out, as are you, where am I now? Why is this guy chasing me with a chainsaw and cutting me in half? Um, <laughs> you know, you, you find Why yourself- am I being cut in half? You find yourself moving from, from, from one location to another. And, and sometimes it may be, it makes sense why. Sometimes you're not exactly sure what just happened. Like, how did I just end up here? Um, so we want that to be a sort of a discovery that you're making along with Sebastian, what's real, what's, what's not real, um, and, and part of the survival is also sort of figuring out the story. There's a fantastic scene in, in the demo you showed us a little earlier where this, this character we see here at the chainsaw is, is terrorizing Sebastian, who's sort of creeping through all these different right. rooms, and it, it's a very, very tense sequence that goes on and on and on where you have to stay away from this guy. If he sees you, it's done. Right. Talk about that sort of that helplessness of the lead character. Yeah, you know, it, it is a game that we want to be difficult. We don't want it to feel like, um, oh, this is just really easy and I can make mistakes and I'll be fine. Like, part of the the survival aspect and the horror aspect is, is creating that tension. Uh, and in that scene you're talking about, in fact, in this whole first part, you're, you're defenseless. You've got no weapons, no nothing. You just have to think your way through the uh, areas that you're in, figure out, like, I need to hide here. I need to let this guy go by. 
You know, he's moving around, he's in between where you're trying to get to. You know, how can I distract him or, or how can I lure him to one area so that I can move around him? So again, you feel like you have tools at your disposal, but those tools might be, you know, just an empty bottle on the floor. Are you thinking through, I can hide in here and he'll go by and, and those kinds of things. So we don't feel like you have to be killing something for it to be tense and fun. That certainly there's gonna be those moments, but you never know when they're gonna be. Yep. And you're gonna be opening a door and thinking like, well, is this gonna be the part where I'm fighting something? Or is it just an empty room where there's some resource? Like that constant off balance and never sure, you know, what is it I'm gonna have to deal with next is part of the fun and creating that tension. Now talk about the killing people part of it. You're, we've seen this in action. It looks great. It's classic. It's over the shoulder. Very few bullets though. So you gotta go for headshots. And there's actually some moves that you can do to. To, to actually conserve that ammo. I mean, I saw letting guys on fire, right. for instance, can be a very effective tactic. Yeah, but again, it's one of those things. So, uh, first of all, the system is designed such that headshots don't always kill enemies. Oh, And sometimes they go down, and sometimes you'll see them sort of shake it off and keep coming at you, and then you're like, oh, okay, that didn't work out like I planned. Now what? You can uh, shoot a guy's legs, and he'll fall down on the ground. Now, maybe you, you took him down, and he's going to stay there, or maybe he's just faking it and waiting for you to get close so he can jump at you. Um, you have matches that you can use to run up on enemies and light them on fire so that you don't have to use up your bullets to finish off an enemy. But again, you're taking that chance. Like, well, he, he's probably down for good, but if I go to light him on fire, there's also a chance he's gonna jump at you. So again, it's that idea that headshots don't always kill, guys that are down aren't always dead. It's not just like, oh, I, I could just do this and it's not a problem. Again, you never know when the game is gonna throw a curveball at you. Uh, and it's about, uh, res um, Keep conserving those resources and making sure you're u making every bullet count, you know, saving your ammo, using your traps when you really need them to take out groups of enemies. Um, it, you know, you're going to be constantly thinking your whole way through. There's another scene I loved where it, it was it was hordes of enemies assault this 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 area, and you're in a building or in a house, and they start. I mean, you, they're running at you with torches. They're piling in yep. and and traps. These sort of these like bear trap explosive bombs. Yeah, the mine traps. Place, the yep. mine traps. Very interesting, and it was very strategic. It was almost not tower defense, but it was like a very care you had to very carefully sort of arrange these to get maximum impact. Yeah, talk about some of those. Well, and the, so there's two things you touched on there. Number one, traps are a big theme in the game. You're going to see traps get used against you all the time by your enemies and trying to finish you off and kill you. But there are also things that you can find and use to deal with the guys that are trying to get you. Again, it's another resource. So you got to be smart about when you use them. But that scene you're talking about in the demo, it plays out different every time. So uh, Jason Bergman, who's the producer behind the, behind the scenes playing the game, you know, every time he has no, like, no idea how they're gonna come through because sometimes the big, slower guys actually make it through the window first <laughs> and they don't go That's down from good, the traps. Yeah. Sometimes the fast, quicker guys manage to get through first and so the traps do take them out and he has a little time. But he, you know, he came close to dying a couple times yesterday just because he, it didn't happen kind of how he was hoping and he had to, he had to scramble a little bit to, to not die. So that, that's the kind of game that we want. And even the demo makes the producer's life a little harder, but it sure makes the game a whole lot of fun. Now, I know you guys are being cryptic about the story, and I wouldn't have it any other way. But some of these enemies that I see, I mean, they're not zombies. Right. They seem demonic in some way or, or, or sort of supernatural in some way. I mean, what, what, what is the sort of theme with, with, with all of this? Um, uh, a good observation. Uh, we certainly have plenty of sort of recognizable uh, humanoid enemies to deal with but then again like it's it's Shinji he's not the father of survival horror for no reason like the guy's got some pretty twisted warped ideas on how to scare people and you know that's one of the things that he's talked about is what used to scare people like back when he created Resident Evil 1 doesn't really work today like things like blood and guts and gore like that stuff is in all kinds of games now so it doesn't have the same impact you aren't like scared or frightened just by oh there's blood and now <laughs> so you have to figure out new ways to sort of shake people up and and some of the creations that he's come up with and he and his team have come up with uh, are going to be introduced along the way so that just when you feel like you sort of wrapped your head around and like okay I can't possibly see anything more horrifying than that last thing here comes something else and again, what those are and like where they come from and do they represent something or are they something manifested? That's something for you and Sebastian to figure out as you go along. The Evil Within coming out next year on PS3 and PS4. One more question for you because Bethesda really on a roll. Dishonored, Skyrim, The Evil Within. What, what's going on? I mean, you guys, I've never seen you in this kind of form. You know what? I mean, we, we have spent a long time finding a, and working with a lot of studios 
to create the kind of games that we're uh, really excited about. And I think when you talk about Roth and Harvey and the Arcane guys on Dishonor, Todd Howard and his team at Bethesda Game Studios, Shinji Mikami and his team at Tango, the guys from Machine Games that you're going to have up here in a minute, you know, a legacy of making really great stuff, and they all just want their chance to make something great. Uh, you know, bringing Elder Scrolls Online to PS4. Uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a great time for us. We're continuing to find folks who are really passionate about what they do and have a really great idea. And really, it's just about supporting those guys and help them realize those games and PS3 and PS4 gamers get to enjoy them. All right, and they will, I have no doubt. Thank you, Pete. And uh, coming up next, we're going to check out Wolfenstein, The New Order. But first, let's check in on the trailer for Batman Arkham Origins. <laughs> This city has a problem. Some freak who thinks he's a hero. Luckily, there ain't a problem in the world that can't be solved with a little bit of money. Tonight, we all win. One of you walks away with $50 million. And the rest, well... We get rid of the bad man. <laughs> Where's Black Mask? Let me go! If you insist. of you to drop in.